Joining me today on the Gridiron Gallery podcast, I have a very special guest. I have been looking forward to talking CFL, XFL uh, since the news was broken. I have been kind of uh, waiting in the wings to gather all the information that I can, or at least what I can from various sources, including one of the best online, Three Down Nation, which I am honored on today's show to have uh, one of the head authors and a uh, and the insider from Three Down Nation himself, one of the best in the biz for the CFL. It is Justin Dunk. Justin, good to have you on the show. Uh, I'm just going to lead off with this. What is? What have you? How have you taken this in in the last 20 days? It is a as of our recording, it has now been the 20 day mark since the official announcement of this partnership, if you will, or what will be maybe even more than that. I mean, where are you at with this right now? First of all, man, nice to join you. And over the last 20 days, it's been intriguing from my perspective because I found that there are people here and there more willing behind the scenes to talk about it a little bit. Before the news came out, I had an idea that there was some discussions going on, but couldn't quite put my finger on what was being discussed. So I wasn't able to report anything concrete. But as we've gone along here, you pick up the clues and you have people that you trust point you in smart directions and you really start to understand a little bit, let's say, where this could be pointed to because I get the sense that this could be something that is bigger maybe than anybody had anticipated initially when that news broke. Right. And we, I mean, uh, TSN's very own David Naylor said it the best um, that this is big news. Uh, it's not something to be a, a light of the same day on March 10th on Twitter. That was one thing that was posted there as well. So, you know, it's gotten our attention and uh, it's definitely made the communities at least very much mingle together, uh, brought mm -hmm. plenty of interest to the CFL. Uh, Canadians I have seen are also very interested in what the XFL is capable of. Um, I want to get your thoughts on, or at least your uh, afterthoughts on this. I know you had a Q and a with, with the, uh, with Commissioner Randy Ambrosi himself, uh, very much just after this news was announced at the time. Um, and at that time, it sounded like this was very early talks from some of the questions and answers from Randy himself. Uh, is that still the sense you are getting right now, or is it definitely moving and getting some traction in these last uh, 20 days? It's certainly well ahead of even what Randy Ambrosi had said in terms of answers that day, because going into that interview, I knew that I wanted to ask him about where it was and how far along and who contacted who and how it all began. But I also knew that it wasn't just talking about talking, which is the famous quote that a lot of people are talking about up here, which was Randy Ambrosi's sort of go-to phrase after the announcement was released publicly. So he wouldn't really go into any of the details, no matter how hard I poked and prodded. And it was really a lot of, I felt like, public relations speak, let's call it. He was clearly staying on message. And the reason is, from what I've been able to gather, is that the major parties that are involved in this have all signed non-disclosure agreements. Normally in the CFL, especially with my contact base, it's a very small league. It sort of has that community feel. Obviously, the Canadians love it because of its unique Canadian rules most probably importantly among them, the three downs. And stuff doesn't really stay quiet if you're connected in those proper ways. So to me, that's been the most telling sign that something big is happening here is that people are actually honoring their word for once and keeping their mouths shut, which makes it a little more difficult for reporters like me and guys like yourself trying to get the information and see what's actually going on. But to me, it really stood out that day because Ambrosi was staying on message, clearly something that they had gone over before and prepared for to give us a talking point, but not much more. Right. And hey, many of us in the XFL community, for my site in particular, XFL Newsroom, for my affiliate, you know, we're trying to figure this out as we go too. And we're also trying to, you know, kind of grasp what, what's, which sides are looking for what. You know, the XFL is trying to, at least from what we can tell, they're trying to get things started and get on a roll, but they see an opportunity with the CFL, who is definitely the more grounded, the more established league that is going to be able to give them an opportunity to say, hey, you know, here's someone that knows how the game works. Um, and I, I want to, I'm just want to, I'm curious here. The CFL, they, they've kind of deflected some of the ownerships for groups like, say, Winnipeg and Saskatchewan of uh mentioned that they have moved on from saying this is more about, say, a money deal or at least trying to influx money. Um, however, 
you do have the likes of, say, Daniel Cohen. He is a uh, financial advisor, if you will, from a high firm called Octagon, um, saying that this is worth almost $100 million U.S. annually if they try and go to a merger, which I'm not saying that's the case right now, but if that was to be certain, that is projected $100 million. Is that something you think that's being looked at still right now? It's a lot of speculation going on, I should mention. It's is for stories, but it seems like merger comes up more and more often as the days go by. It really does. And that seems to be what all the signs are pointing to right now. Although if that eventually does happen, there's still a lot to be worked through. I essentially think what the announcement was, was to really put it out there for the CFL and XFL to say on both sides of the border, we're open for business. And I really think that gets at what you're talking about with a potential television contract, corporate sponsors, streaming rights. And the big one, especially for us up here in Canada, is betting because it's soon going to be legal up here, single game betting, that is. So I really got the sense that it wasn't so much an announcement for maybe the reasons we thought it was to get it out there, but it was for the corporations that maybe don't have the connections or follow all the behind the scenes with both leagues to say, hey, we're open for business. You want to come talk about a television contract? Pick up the phone, give us a call. Heck, we'll give you a call about it and have those types of conversations. And as those happen, then they can have their discussions in terms of between the CFL and the XFL and see where they come out on the minutia of it, the stuff that the fans care about, specifically up in Canada, the rules and the tweaks and those things that might not that might happen. So when you talk about a potential of a hundred million dollar TV deal. It's a big number, but the CFL already has a $50 million TV deal annually with TSN. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, it should be on multiple networks up in Canada and for the uninitiated down in the U.S. and your audience. Sportsnet and TSN are the big two sports media companies in Canada that have all of the rights. Sportsnet has all the Blue Jays games in the summer and typically... TSN tries to go up against those with the CFL. Obviously not as many games, but that's one of their major summer content drivers. Sportsnet has all of the hockey rights, except for some regional ones and some games that, I don't know the exact minutia, but they get passed back and forth like the Maple Leafs and the other Canadian teams. But Sportsnet has all of the Stanley Cup playoffs. They have the Stanley Cup, which is the golden jewel up here. For the Raptors, those go back and forth. So there's a lot at play here in terms of content for TSN because, as I said, it's such a big summer driver for them. But if you're the CFL and you're looking at it going, well, the potential of a $100 million TV deal doesn't seem all that big when you already have a $50 million TV deal in your pocket. Now, where I think the CFL is hoping to go is get into some of those American markets and at least have their product on. And then maybe in the future the deal becomes bigger. And can that deal be boosted initially by a guy like The Rock who has the following that he does and maybe creating content around it? I've heard people tell me that they're thinking of the concept of the ballers, but in real life where they have a reality show that follows The Rock around. So lots of different unique content you can create when you have a guy like The Rock. Absolutely. And we we as XFL fans have definitely been promised that that was one of the initial things was they were going to focus heavily on the content front eventually with the iteration of the xfl which by the way as you and i now know and for those listening we're still technically on hold for 2022 season in the xfl side the cfl has definitely said now uh after some recent reports that they are definitely going to be playing 2021 and it looks like they have made steps towards that as well you, you bring up an interesting point i wanted to ask about the tv side of this and i'm glad that you did and you kind of talk about the exposure that the cfl is looking for they're trying to find and they've looked for in their history ways to kind of bridge the gap to the u.s audience um and some some fans some pundits uh they have talked about the failed 1993 expansion into the u.s and i know this has been brought up by many people that this xfl potential merger partnership if you want could have some ramification maybe of this how would this be how much would this be different or what steps would needed to be in this case to avoid say a u.s expansion that would have issues of a stadium or in terms of stadium sizes and you know uh dimensions if you will if they were to go say the cfl way of the uh, stadium dimensions and uh, rule sets 
To the best of my knowledge, that U.S. expansion was really done out of necessity. The league was really on death's door, and they had to do it to see if they can generate any other interest outside of the country. Obviously, everybody looks back on it as not being successful, but I don't think you can directly compare it, and I believe this is what you're getting at, with what we're potentially looking at here with the CFL and the XFL because The Rock is a difference maker, and also, which I think has gone a little bit under the radar, Redbird Capital. They have yes. all of those assets, right? It's over three or four billion dollars. So the money is there to sustain it for the long term if they feel like it's viable or they can see that upward trend in the short term. So to me, that's the key. That's why it's totally different. People in the CFL feel like they need to get into the American markets and get established to really grow the game. I do think there's still room in Canada to increase their revenue streams. There's a couple lost generations up here because to be quite honest, there's a few teams around the league. A lot of people would point, especially at the Argos and the BC Lions where the marketing budget just really hasn't been spent there or the dollars haven't been spent there, I should say. And there's people that really feel like they lost a couple generations as well because they weren't in on the grassroots level. I'll give you a quick example. Up here, you can go around to the major centers and you can see the NFL in those markets with what they're doing with flag football. They're getting that gear out to get their product in front of the younger demographics so they grow up with it. But I had a coach from Northern Ontario contact me not too long ago and say, hey, can you put me in touch with anyone in the CFL office? I'm trying to get some CFL branded flag football gear because we're Canadian. We want to play with the CFL stuff, right? Kind of makes of sense. So I said, yeah, sure thing. I'll do my best that I can. But you would imagine that if somebody's reaching out to the CFL, they would try to get that gear to them as quickly as possible. A small thing, yes, obviously it's going to take some time, but it's going to help grow your game. So those sorts of things really haven't happened across Canada, Canada wide. They have in certain markets. Certainly the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have done a wonderful job of that. They support minor football in a big way. Edmonton would be the same in the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, I would say, and also the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And I think the Ottawa Red Blacks resurgence has shown that you can make a football game less of a game and more of an event because they have a younger crowd there. But I still think there's room to grow in Canada, although the Board of Governors and the powers that be in the CFL really see, and it makes sense because of the sheer population down there, the United States as a way that if they can get in there and establish themselves to supercharge the league. Right. And it, it's a very unique game. Americans, we have our opinion on it. I personally, now I'm, I'm just a massive fan of the sport in general, football's variants. So I'm fine with it. Um, however, you talk to Americans here in the state, or that's very redundant, but you talk to Americans here in the States and, you know, it's a mixed bag, you know, because it's different. You have the waggle, which I'm used to that in arena football, by the way. That's very, uh, very transitional mm-hmm. type of concept. Uh, you know, you have, of course, three downs, so a lot more passing, very much less running and such. So that in American exposure, you have to get more acquainted with the game. Uh, how much of a, I'm, I'm assuming you would see maybe a hybrid setup, perhaps, because the XFL has its own set of rules, uh, very much more Americanized. But this is a conversation of, you know, what is, what gets split up here? Obviously, obviously the ratio, I think, is going to be one of the biggest conversational pieces with these type of rule sets because you do have to maintain a specific no, seven starters on your team in Canada right now that are from Canada itself or the na- in that nation. You only limit a certain amount of imports, which I'm used to with talking European club teams. Um, what would be for yourself an ideal mixture, if you will, between, say, the American game and the CFL if it had to come to that? Oh, well, I'm not me, saying it will, and, but if you had to do it. <laughs> yeah, if I guess if I was sort of cooking the meal, so to speak, I really think that the three downs is a unique way to market the game differently. And you kind of mentioned it earlier that you're going to have these issues that you run into with the U.S. stadiums if we do get that far with the size of the football field. So I think it'd probably be easier to make the same width of a Canadian field. I'm just kind of guessing there but the length would be an issue. So I don't really think the length matters overall, but some people do want to keep the longer end zones because it does make it 
a little more interesting when you get down in the red zone. It's not as compacted as it is in the NFL game. And I really think the three downs is just such a calling card of our game. I mean, former XFL commissioner Oliver Luck was very complimentary of the CFL. They even took the play clock from up here, as yes. you well know, and implemented it down there. So it has a faster feel to it. Plus, there's more possession. So people will talk about at the end of games in the NFL. And I don't think it's so much the case because the NFL has really morphed into a CFL style of game. I'll give you an example. Ten years ago, Lamar Jackson would be an absolute star up here or would have had a great shot to be. He was on a negotiation list. But because the NFL game has evolved so much that way, he's in the NFL. Russell Wilson would be another example of that. I would even say Justin Fields, the guy coming out in the draft this year, another one. So many players like that would have been in the CFL before. So I think really for me, if you're going to mix them together, you got to keep the three downs. You got to keep the play clock with the XFL already has, and then you can work from there. But I think from the Canadian perspective and for the followers of the game that have really kept this league going over the recent years, and I'm talking about the people that are a little older, but that are invested in the league, they said that they might turn away if it's not three downs. Now, I understand the other side in the perspective where the XFL or even the CFL might be thinking, well, generally around the world, the four down game is played and more understandable for the fan that might tune in. But I just think you can tweak it still and have some of the traits of both games, but make it three downs. Yeah. And I, I really do appreciate the three down. Like I said, I know I'm, I'm talking arena just from my, my own experience talking that, but it, it very much reminds me of arena football's past happiness in an open setting like that, you know, it's much, much faster. It's much more uh, at least explosive. The tension's more built up because you really only have about two downs to convert a first down. Otherwise we punt, you know, Americans, we get an extra down. So you know, we got to deal with that, that little bit of a uh, buffer, if you will, added into the game. Something that I like that you brought up there, there has also been this conversation of the traditionalist CFL fan or those that don't want to see the game go away. And again, I don't want it to go away. I was, I'm again, I'm stressing those watching or listening to this show. I was posed, I'm posing this question to you. So that is why I pose the, you know, the kind of the mashup, but I want the game to, I would love to see the game stay. Um, but it seems like there is like, you're talking a generational drift, if you will, with the CFL that they're trying to grab. That is some of the XFL's own positives with maybe a more youthful touch to it or trying to expand the game into more of a youthful sense or the younger generations. Um, I mean, is that, how do you break that in terms of just trying to make sense of moving forward with the CFL? For example, say this merger or partnership that we're talking about doesn't work out. Where does the CFL go in that sense? If they just go their separate ways with the XFL and maintain course or status quo, as it's been mentioned, they would certainly be looking for increased revenue opportunities, even if nothing happens with the XFL and the top one's going to be betting. So I'll give you an example when that passes in Canada. And I really believe now it's a matter of if not when, or sorry, if not when it's going to happen, that that's going to increase a new stream for the CFL that they could capitalize on. And I've used this example before, and I think it's so perfect for our conversation. Now I played five years of university football in Canada, at the university right. of Guelph, I was a starting quarterback and all of the guys I played with there grew up playing three down football for the most part. There were some leagues in the summer that we played four down, but it was mostly three down. We all played three down in university. And those group of guys that I'm still friends with to this day, my best boys, were in an NFL fantasy league together that's gone on since university. They all watched the NFL. But when this news came out with the XFL and the CFL and the idea that they can maybe gamble on CFL football from a single game perspective, that's a game changer. And I think the CFL really sees it as a way to potentially draw back some of those lost generations because you can have those single game bets. You can have the prop bets that everybody's obviously talking about for the Super Bowl, but from a game to game basis, you know, just in Canada. So I think that's one way that they can grow revenues, certainly. And I think the other way is getting back out in the grassroots. And that may take more time for you to get the actual money in your pocket, but is having the CFL visibly out there consistently 
It's one thing to do it here and there. And the CFL is famous for in the off season, wanting to go dark after the Grey Cup is played in November, but websites like Three Down Nation and even some other ones that you're starting to see, and even the league's own website, CFL.ca, understand you've got to have content every day. You want your league to be in the conversation, right? You know that very well yes. with how football is talked about down there, and especially the, the NFL. So I think the CFL is starting to understand that. We had an interesting piece actually on Three Down Nation over the weekend that had a comparison between the Canadian Premier League, which is a soccer league that's only two years into its existence up here, but has quickly developed a following. And they have a streaming service set up with a company called One Soccer that has content set up around the games. And obviously there's other soccer and a bunch that's going on outside of the Canadian Premier League, but they're a part of it. So it's always within that conversation. So could the CFL set up something like that, which is sort of a pseudo NFL network, but where you're driving the conversation, you have content out there all the time. And that's one of the reasons why I think even if nothing works out between the CFL and the XFL, the announcement alone has Canadians talking more about the CFL in March than I've experienced in my lifetime. And I'm 35, so it's been a while. <laughs> hey, I, I'm happy to hear it too. I mean, I, many of us, I would say just to the American experience, we know, we know the CFL is there. We just have, you know, I would say this is definitely the most we've even heard of the league for sure in some time. You know, uh, I would say a lot of people, they kind of default the CFL. They go, oh, yeah, Doug Flutie played there or, or you know, <laughs> about that. Like, they played, like, yeah, Doug was in there for the 90s. He played for, uh, what was that, the Calgary Stampeders, right? <laughs> right. And the Argos. <laughs> and maybe you know that. But, um, you know, I, I, I will say that it's definitely been a great interest piece so far uh, to keep up with it. And, you know, I've been happy to be checking out many of the teams and just the rules itself. And I, you know, for those listening, I recommend you do that as well. And, you know, tune into or check out three down nation for many of the write-ups. And by the way, you know, you talk about the Canadian premier league. I was, if you didn't say it, I was going to say it because I'm, I'm shocked <laughs> that there isn't a service yet like that for the CFL. I mean, the league is, you know, the league rivals the NFL actually it's, it's origins are even longer than the NFL in terms of just its age. Um, I'm just surprised and kind of looking at the history is this has kind of been the case with the league. Am I right? Just kind of uh, sometimes a few steps behind and maybe a development in some areas. Is that right? Exactly. And it's really just because they don't have the funds or haven't decided to put the funds in there, I should say, because you still have the six private owners and a number of them, Bob Young with Hamilton, the Greenberg family in Ottawa that have big successful businesses outside of the CFL. So they could have put money into this and, there's not a lot of people that know that, you know, as recently as like the 1970s and 1980s, even there were CFL teams that were outbidding NFL teams for players. So that's a little known fact. And it's interesting to look back at that and then see where the leagues are now today, where the NFL just signs a hundred billion plus television contract, yeah. hundred billion dollar plus, And the CFL has a $50 million one. Now, the population is obviously different, approximately 30 million in Canada, 330 million down in the United States. But when you look at that, just one detail that at one time the CFL was outbidding NFL teams, it really shows you that from that point, the NFL just took off and the CFL sort of sat idle. So I think to your point in terms of the content that yes, the CFL is behind. They just recently during the pandemic put up some old gray cup games online and made them viewable. It took years for that to happen. You want people consuming your product. You want it up on YouTube these days, you know, to get the new generation in. But a lot of people will tell you that has to do with the TSN deal that they have, that it's so exclusive. And there has to be so much conversation that goes on with the main rights holder before any of that content can get online, that it becomes a long drawn out task. But I think the CFL is starting to realize that you need to have it at the fingertips. And I remember the quote from Adam Silver. It's always imprinted in my mind. If you have a snack, they'll want to come back for the full meal. That was how he felt about having NBA highlights pasted all over YouTube. Any account can put highlights up, right? It's not yeah. quite the same with the CFL, but they're really starting to get it. Uh, yeah, I think I think this announcement alone just has to help with that in any case. You know, the TSN deal is very interesting, I think, in play with what is a potential future setup. Because they signed in 2019. It's a six-year deal added on. Um, how would how would this work, at least that you would think, if, say, 
it seems like the timeline's drifting towards say 2023 ish that they would, if they were to talk a potential partnership leaning merger, that they would have it all set up together where they could maybe cross the border, if you will, for games. I mean, how does this come into play? Because I understand they want games in the summer with this deal, right? And that's the main gist of it is to get that summer audience and have summer viewership on their network. Exactly. So that deal would have to be looked at or maybe even redone. And TSN is really, along with the CFL, for these exploratory talks, let's say. They're right there. They're invested in it. So I would imagine they would be open to amending that contract if it was needed. So they're very big into it. They have all of the NFL rights. It should be said up here. So their Sundays are clearly packed. They put it out on CTV. So Bell Media has TSN, which is their big sports brand, but CTV is their national, more news known brand, let's say. Okay. So pretty much if you have a TV with an antenna, old school style in Canada, you'll get CTV. TSN is a paid cable channel. So it's a little different. So they'll put NFL games, especially the Super Bowl, always goes on CTV so you can have the biggest audience, right? Obviously get more advertising dollars in. But that's to say that when it comes to the CFL season and when the games are played in the summer, they're on some Sundays. There are some teams that have some home Sunday games. But when it comes into the fall and the NFL starts, there have been few and far between as the years have gone along where they go up and compete against the NFL. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So right. TSN, I think from that point, standpoint, is really going to be looking at it and saying, hey, we want games on, but not competing against the NFL. Yeah, and, that, and to understand, that, that's exactly to, your po to the point, another point I was going to bring up. The NFL does indeed have a presence in all of this in Canada, correct? I mean, I know, I know football, at least my research, you can, you can uh, discredit me on that if you will. Hockey is the de facto big-time sport in, in Canada, but even football is kind of down on the list in terms of popularity from what I understand. From a television viewership standpoint, football, from my perspective, and the CFL ratings and even the NFL ratings would be number two. The gold standard in terms of TV ratings in this country, you hit it on the head, is hockey. Everyone talks about, you know, Hockey Night in Canada is on Saturday night. And generally, especially if the Leafs are good, they're going to get over a million viewers. Now, you consider the population up here is only 30 million, and you have a million of them watching a Leafs game. Well, you look at the averages over the years, and we've tracked this on Three Down Nation very extensively. And we're actually the only site that tracks the TV ratings to this de great degree that you put on a CFL game, even if the, it's the Argos and the Lions. The Toronto Argos generally draw pretty well on TV. That no matter what the teams are, unless it's two terrible teams at the end of a season, last year the Red Blacks and Argos were awful. A couple of those games got under 400,000 viewers but you're going to average at least 500,000 viewers over the course of your season. And for the playoff games, obviously it's going to be higher and great cups is going to be in the multi millions, right? We're going to talk about three, four, five, six, seven million. And every year the great cup is going to be one of the top 10 most watched television programs in the country. So football is right there in my mind as a number two. Yes. The Raptors had a great run and it was pretty cool to see what happened in Toronto after they won in 2019 with Kawhi Leonard and everything that went down. Three of those finals games were in the top 10 in terms of TV performance that year. But generally when it comes to TV ratings, the CFL crushes the Raptors, crushes Toronto FC, crushes any of the major league soccer teams up here. And it's really just underneath by admittedly a decent margin the nhl games right fair enough and thank you for putting my place for the viewership <laughs> like i said based on <laughs> just so just what my research so it doesn't mean it's always correct uh so fair enough so in that case so and so football second second overall viewed sport or at least one that is up there at number two consistently how does the nfl does the nfl slash into that heavily or is this more we're cfl with maybe some nfl fans that are kind of they're looking over into the States. The NFL is still really followed up here. It's heavily bet. And depending on what part of the country you're in could sort of determine your fandom. I'll give you an example. The Seattle Seahawks in Vancouver, they have, when they did have a radio station out there, it was actually just taken off the air. TSN 
had a radio station out there. They had pre and post game coverage on TSN radio out there for the Seahawks games. So that's how invested they were out there. They really saw the Seahawks as their team in Vancouver, much less so, unfortunately, for the CFL than the BC Lions. You look at Toronto and the area I grew up in, Guelph, Ontario is just outside of Toronto, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And it's so close to Niagara Falls. And obviously just over the board, you have the Buffalo Bills. So a lot of people talk about, and my buddies that I grew up around here with, go to Bills tailgates, are big Bills fans. Well, you'll find pockets of sort of different fans around the country. So the NFL is certainly well followed up here. And especially, I think maybe even more importantly for us going forward, it's well bet. At Three Down Nation, we have a partnership with Bodog Canada. And during the NFL season, even if there's hockey on, football is consistently, by a wide margin, the highest bet sport wow. in Canada. And it is not even close. Wow. I did not see that. I honestly did not see that one coming. Um, that That's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. So, uh, yeah, obviously, there is definitely some spread. Um, and definitely, I would. it definitely sounds like it is, uh, you know, at least takes a bit of a, some of a chunk, you know, for viewership. Uh, and potential influence um, for you in particular with this, with this deal now. Um, and as we kind of close up our conversation here, which I thank you again for coming on, by the way, uh, this has been really informative for myself. And of course, it's been great to talk this. It's, it's been a wild time for both, for both, both sides of us <laughs> for this news coverage. Um, what are you at the end of the day in particular? Cause everyone has their own opinion on this. What do you at the end of the day want to see come out of this deal? or this partnership, not deal, this is a partnership. Mm -hmm. Overall, I guess from the CFL's perspective, and that's just sort of the league I've covered for so many years and the lens that I look at, at it through, but I also think for the XFL, just a long-term viable football league. So whether that is actually, and you've mentioned it a couple times now, a merger between the CFL and the XFL, whatever that league might even potentially be called, but just a league that's, economically sustainable and viable for the long term. To me, that's really the key. There's been a lot of discussion up here and my colleague at Three Down Nation, John Hodge, has done a wonderful job of going back and grabbing some old economic numbers, some old attendance figures, comparing them today, even comparing the average fan age of different sports. The PGA right. Tour was one that came to mind for me. So there's not great content <clears throat> sorry i should say lots of great content about that on three on nation and what it really showed to me is that the cfl doesn't necessarily and this is just in my opinion have as big of a problem as they're making it out to be they bring in in a normal year when they're playing football recently between 200 to 240 million dollars of revenue so that's a starting point for a football league I mean, Vince McMahon, I'm sure, would have took that with the XFL the first time and probably even the second time, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> so there's some people docking up here. Well, if you can sort of streamline your business and you look at what the XFL did in terms of centralizing scouting, for an example, right? And they didn't have maybe as many coaches on the coaching staff and they didn't have as many scouts on the scouting staff because the league was doing more of it. That if the CFL was able to streamline their business and they really only play the pay the players about a quarter of their revenues around 25% where every other league, I think it's well known is more like 50%. So it's not like the players are a major drain on the league. And especially when you're talking about so many guys now making under a hundred thousand dollars, the minimum is 65. Yes. But the group that's over a hundred thousand has shrunk dramatically. And there's only two non quarterbacks that are making over 200,000. That'd be Willie Jefferson in Winnipeg and Edmonton defensive end, Kwaku Boateng. So other than the starting quarterbacks, you have two guys in that $200,000 group. You got this shrinking pool of guys that are in the $100,000 category and the rest between 65 and 100, obviously. So the players aren't the dream. So to me, you start with that number in terms of revenue, like I said, 200, $240 million. If you streamline what you're doing, then you can make money here, especially if you try to grow it from the grassroots, add in the betting revenue and continue to look at these other avenues. Maybe the content one is an idea where they can have a subscription fee, much like one soccer does. So I think for me, just overall, regardless of what happens, Canadians will want to see their history and traditions preserved in a viable league for the long term. 
you know what? And that's something that I definitely have, I would say I've noticed with these talks and just interacting with Canadian fans is that, you know, the pride of the sport in particular is one of the number one things that comes up. I think the most, at least when it comes to talking about this uh, potential partnership. So um, I'm looking forward to see where this goes, you know, cause it, it's definitely, you know, it's exciting, but you know, with that point in particular, you know, you're definitely walking, I would say sometimes uh, maybe on eggshells, if you will. Certainly it's going to be tricky in the dynamic of it. And people have had the debate, right? I'm also a sports anchor in the weekends at CHDH TV in Hamilton, obviously where the Tiger Cats are. And we've had debates around the office and even some fans have chimed in on social media. Can't be out too much with COVID-19, obviously. But yeah, in saying, you know, if the game did change to four downs, would the diehard Tiger Cats fans not be fans of that franchise anymore? It's hard to think that that would actually be possible. And I think that's part of what some of the presidents in the league or the board of governors or the commissioner, Randy Ambrosi, or some of the people that are the stakeholders, let's call it, at the CFL level are thinking, well, you have these franchises that in a number of cases, you know, Saskatchewan, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Calgary, and Hamilton, even Ottawa, I think in particular, six strong bases there where you've had fans for a while that are they really going to turn their back on their team just because they're playing four down football might take some time to swallow it and get used to it but I think that kind of gets you inside some of their thinking there these people are so dedicated to it it's still going to be the Hamilton Tiger Cats for example yeah a lot of stuff that's coming up a lot of still things that are not decided as Justin mentioned that this is very serious. So, I mean, if he's having trouble finding any information right now, or at least anything that's moving past what we've already heard, then, uh, you know, this is going to be big, going to be big. Uh, Justin, thank you again. Really. I appreciate the insight, the conversation and just, you know, I, I feel like I'm a hundred times much more informed on at least the con, at least not only the Canadian sports scene, but also just, you know, the CFL in general and some of the aspects. So I appreciate that kind of a learning session, if you will. Um, where can we find you and uh, what's coming up with three down nation right now? Uh, so first where you can find me at jdunk 12 on Twitter, have all the latest stuff there. Like I said, if I can chip any of this sort of bigger stuff out, it'll be there. And then three down nation always has fresh content, the latest news in terms of what's going on around the CFL. And then obviously now with the XFL negotiation. So we're always up on the latest news breaking as much as we can. So for any of your listeners or viewers that are out there, and I appreciate you having us on and plugging us so much, that's where you can find us at JDunk12 on Twitter, at 3 Down Nation on Twitter. My colleague John Hodge has done some great work at John D. Hodge on Twitter. We're also on Instagram at well at, as well at pretty much the same handles. 3 Down Nation is there. Um, my, tw- my Instagram handle a little bit different. It's JDunk underscore 12 because that username got taken up. But, anyways, <laughs> that's where you can find us, and we'll always have all the latest, man. And honestly, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, I appreciate coming on with you. And it's been intriguing to hear the American perspective of it because I think it's given Canadians a little bit more sense of pride that the Americans actually do respect our game and do understand that it is unique, that it is cool, that it is fun and fast paced. So talking to guys like you have really shown that to me. So I appreciate you sharing some time. Well, and thank you very much. And to those out there listening, I highly recommend you keep pace with Three Down Nation and any other pundits such as such as TSN as well, like, say, David Naylor out there, who's also an insider for them, uh, and keep up with the league. It, it, the CFL has the CFL has a rich history. It is an exciting game, and I, I can't wait to watch what will hopefully be a wonderful return in this coming this uh, late spring in 2021. So, Justin, thank you very much. Uh, again, Justin Dunk from C- CFL's uh, very own Three Down Nation uh, joined the show. And, uh, you know, couldn't be happier to have you on, man. Appreciate you. The Great Iron Gallery Podcast. New episodes every Friday on your favorite podcast platforms, YouTube, and premiering first, as always, at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, only on unhingedsn.com.